Welcome. Welcome to Massey College. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers and I'm the principal of Massey College. Massey College, or beautiful college that we're going to talk about today, is built on indigenous land, the land of the Yorunwendat, the Seneca, and it is the treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. I want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward this land and also the great privilege that we have to continue to do our work here. Today, it's a special dialogue where we're going to uh, speak about uh, the Massey family and the Massey fortune. This is in preparation for the celebration of the college history that takes place on Friday at the high table. So I just want to, uh, I'm so delighted that to welcome our new senior fellow, uh, Dimitri Anastaskis, who is the L.R. Wilson R.J. Curry Chair in Canadian Business History in the Department of History and at the Rotten School of Management at the University of Toronto. And he will lead us, he's a, one of the main scholars, obviously, on the history of business in Canada, a great scholar on the history of uh, the automobile in industry. I invite you to uh, consult his biography that we put on the website. You'll see his many accomplishments. And I'm just so happy to have him with us today to talk about uh, the Massey fortune. So I know this, we're, we're, I'm just going to let you uh, uh, go to your slide and to your, uh, your, uh, the history. And after that, I've invited uh, a senior fellow, Mark Bonham, to, uh, who's the executive director of the Veritas Foundation, is one of the big philanthropists as well in, in Canada. A great help to Massey, a really wonderful colleague to have at Massey College. So, and we're going to have a bit of a discussion of uh, how do we study business history, why do we do this, and what are the messages that we want our audience to get out of today's lecture. So, uh, Professor uh, Anastakis, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Principal DeRosiers. It's really a thrill to be here. This is the first thing I've ever done as a senior fellow at Massey, so it's a, it's a real thrill for me uh, to be taking part in this Massey dialogue. And I'm really looking forward to chatting with Mark uh, and talking about some of these issues that you mentioned. Uh, I just want to start off by giving a, a fairly brief overview of uh, the Masseys, the Masseys and their monies. And, and I took that title, of course, from an old saying in Canada that existed for a very long time. It's not as common anymore that people always used to say that in Canada, there was really only the masses and the masses who were up <laughs> high above everybody else, an indication of uh, the family's status and wealth. And I'd just like to kick off that first slide there, if we could. Uh, thanks. And, uh, and great, go right into the next slide, please, too. So uh, first thing I want to do is talk a little bit, uh, give you an overview of where we're going to be going in this presentation. And to do so, I really want to talk about uh, the story of where the money came from, which is, in fact, uh, the company, the Massey uh, Ferguson Company, the Massey Company, uh, and the family who built that company. And talk a little bit about that. It's a fascinating tale of Canadian business and gives us an idea of where that money came from. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about where that money went. Uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, all of the philanthropic uh, things that the Massey family did, where they spent the money. Uh, this isn't much of a big reveal here. It's not a spoiler hint. A lot of it came to U of T. Uh, you know, we're, we're sitting in it a little bit here, too. Now, along the way, in talking about where the money came from and where the money went, I want to make a little bit of an argument in saying that I think that this story uh, shows that this is a pretty fascinating tale of a family that while their names may be known to uh, students and the general public, I mean, we know about Massey College and Massey Hall, they're actually uh, Canada's relatively forgotten near royal family. Uh, the Masseys really were that big a deal in Canada that they were kind of seen as being apart from everybody else. Uh, but they're not that well known today. If you were to ask 100 U of T students uh, what Hart House is named after, they probably wouldn't be able to tell you it's named after Hart Massey. Uh, there's not a lot of movies about the Masseys, uh, like there are about other famous uh, families, but uh, it's something that we should talk about. So over the next 19 minutes or so, so I'd like to talk about these topics to explain where the money came from and where it went. And I'm going to do so by going through a whole series of uh, slides, just a few slides actually. I'm going to talk a little bit about the start of the family firm, uh, and how the Massey Company came to be uh, such a huge uh, deal in Canada. 
Uh, we're going to switch a little bit into talking about uh, the globalization of the Massey uh, 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 Ferguson company, uh, its corporate change, and how it also declined. A lot of people don't know that part of the story. And then I'm going to spend uh, just a few minutes talking about uh, where the Massey money did go to in terms of uh, what they spent it on, both in terms of their own personal expenditures, but more importantly, uh, where they gave it away. And, you know, most of the Massey money was actually given away. And it's a pretty amazing story uh, that we'll be able to take a little uh, brief look into. Uh, then I want to just finish off talking a little bit about some of the legacies of the Massey family, uh, particularly Vincent and his role. And then we'll wrap up with uh, just uh, some questions and answers and some dialogues from the audience and from uh, Mark as well. Okay. So, where did the Massey money come from? If we go to the next slide, uh, it came mostly from tractors. More specifically, uh, the Massey money comes from the family firm, the family-owned farm implements co company that was started by Daniel Massey in 1847 in Newcastle, Ontario, not so far from here, just east of here, uh, a firm that was taken over by his son, Hart Massey, in 1851. That, that on the far uh, left on your screen is a picture of Hart Massey, probably taken around the 1850s. And Hart Massey uh, was a farmer originally. He was a, a deeply Methodist man uh, in terms of his faith. He was born in 1823 uh, near Coburg. And I, I like to think of him actually as one of Canada's smartest businessmen ever. I mean, he really did create an amazing firm that became a world leader. In the late 19th century, Hart Massey grew his farm tools business uh, almost exponentially as waves of immigrants came to Canada starting in the 1850s and the 1860s, and we had that big boom. And it started here in Ontario, but it grew all across Canada. And Hart Massey was a fairly shrewd businessman. He did a whole bunch of things to grow his business. He imported a lot of American technologies to stay ahead of the latest developments in farm implements. He supported a protective tariff, that national policy to make sure he, he you know, got the best out of his business. And he was a great salesman. Some of the stuff he did as a salesperson, uh, he created some of the first color catalogs for his products back in the 19th century. He'd have product launches where he'd organize parades when a new Massey product was coming off the line. Uh, he created a whole network of sales agents and dealers all across the country, which was the first time that this was done. And, and he, he spent a lot of time trying to push his business into other markets, uh, particularly Europe and, of course, in the British Empire. Uh, you know, he took his products to international exhibitions to compete with others, and he won a whole bunch of awards. So he was really a smart businessman. And one of the things that he did do uh, that was another aspect of his business acumen is he took over companies. He merged and acquired a lot of companies. And if you take a look at that next image there, this is a great image that describes some of the evolution of the Massey company as the rest of these slides do. So there's an ad from Massey from the 1890s and it says uh, Massey Harris because uh, Massey took over the Harris company, which was a, a, a sharp competitor of his in about 1892 and they merged the company and they really pushed their idea of being a british company that was selling all over the place so they expanded globally they also expanded into different products it wasn't just about farm tools uh that image up there the third image is uh, an advertisement for the massey harris wheel in the 1890s during the bicycle craze that really took over the world when uh you know technologies allowed the creation of new bicycles with tires and frames and stuff like that massey got into the bicycle business and became one of canada's largest bicycle firms uh, it still exists in the form of ccm today uh, but they got into all kinds of different things. And of course, the crowning achievement for the Massey firm was the construction of their facility in Toronto in the 18, late 1870s and early 1880s. So there's a not a very good image of a picture of King Street in Toronto. And many of you have walked down the street on King Street and you've seen all these old buildings. Those are a lot of those are Massey buildings. Some of them have converted into condos or lofts and business places and restaurants. But in the 1880s, that facility was one of the largest, uh, if not the largest manufacturing facility in the British Empire for farm implements. I mean, a good Irmung Warts is big and many of you have been there, but this was even bigger and more impressive. And it really showed just how important uh, farm implements were. By the 1890s, Hart Massey, Massey's company was pretty much the largest company in Canada. It controlled about 60% of the market. And it's not surprising given that this was a country of 
farmers. I mean, uh, we're, we have a country uh, full of farmers where they're building a kind of wheat economy. So it's not surprising. And in a world in the 19th century where agriculture is still the number one thing, uh, this kind of uh, sales, this kind of product really does make uh, Massey uh, household name in Canada, but it also makes the Massey family pretty wealthy and it makes Hart Massey pretty powerful. But change comes, change always comes. So if you want to switch to the next slide, I'd like to talk a little bit for a few minutes about what happened to the Massey company in the 20th century. Uh, Hart Massey died in 1896. And after that, the company was managed by a couple of his sons and eventually one of his grandsons, uh, Vincent Massey. And we all know Vincent Massey. There's a picture of Vincent on the far left. Uh, we're all familiar with the fact that Vincent Massey became a, such a prominent Canadian. We know about his connections to the University of Toronto. We know about his public activities as uh, the Royal Commissioner as the governor general, all the things that he did. But it's important to remember that he was first and foremost an heir to the family firm uh, that built farm tools. And Vincent was his corporate leader in the early 1920s. Now, uh, being a, a fourth generation Massey in the firm, uh, of leading the firm, Vincent realized in the mid 1920s that it was probably his best Bet, and he had the good sense to realize that his future wasn't in the tractor, tractor business. In about 1925, uh, Vincent decided to leave the family business, so the company passed on to managers. So they were no longer Massey's controlling Massey. It was now professional managers. And, and Vincent also decided to start selling off a lot of the family's shares in the company as well. So not only would it no longer be managed by Massey's, it wouldn't be controlled eventually by Massey's. Eventually, uh, the Massey Company was taken over by uh, a financier by the name of E.P. Taylor. Some of you may have heard of him because uh, he built Don Mills, one of the first subdivisions in uh, Toronto. He was also the owner of Northern Dancer, the Canadian horse who won the, the Kentucky Derby. In any event, uh, Taylor takes over Massey and puts it in one of the first Canadian conglomerates called the Argus Corporation. And I want to just finish up the story of Massey in three quick points, which you can see on these slides. The first point is that after uh, 1945, and even before, as we saw with the extended of the British Empire, the Massey Company grew tremendously around the world. Uh, it was one of, and probably was, the first Canadian multinational firm. Uh, in its day, it was the Bombardier of its day, or the Blackberry or Rim of its day, or uh, the Magna of its day. I mean, it was a really a global Canadian firm and a global Canadian brand. Uh, and that image, the second image, really gives an indication of that. That's a, a tractor factory in England where Massey had taken over the Ferguson Company in 1953. And uh, Massey took over a whole bunch of companies around the world. It took over companies in the 50s, 60s, and 70s in Australia, Italy, Spain, South America, South Africa, Brazil, Argentina, Germany, and India. They were building tractors all over the world. By, 19, by the 1960s, Massey Ferguson was one of the largest farm implements manufacturers in the world. In fact, I remember when I was young, I was in Greece uh, in about 1993, and there was an old broken down Massey tractor uh, sitting there. And I said to my cousin, oh, there's like a Massey tractor that was probably built in Canada. And my cousin turned to me and said, what are you crazy? That's Massey Ferguson. It's Greek. They, they make them here. They sell them here. And I was like, you know, but what did I know back then? The second thing that happened is in the 60s and 70s, along with this global growth, Massey also branched into different types of products. They started building all kinds of stuff. They started building diesel engines, plows, uh, snow, snow plows, uh, mowers, backhoe loaders, heavy machinery. They even built snowmobiles. So it's kind of far from tractors and farm implements. There's an ad for the Ski Whiz, a snowmobile that Massey was building in the 1960s. Well, uh, eventually, unfortunately, and finally, uh, by the 1970s, uh, Massey Ferguson as a company was in deep trouble. It had expanded too quickly. It had overgrown itself. It was carrying too much debt. And then it got hit by a whole series of recessions. Deindustrialization started occurring in the 1970s. And the efficiency of farm machinery moved away from the small tractors that Massey was doing into the bigger uh, companies that uh, Massey competed with, like John Deere or International Harvester. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, Massey was controlled still by the Argus Corporation, which was controlled then 
by a man who we probably all know, a Conrad Black. There's an image there of Conrad Black on the far right. Uh, and eventually, uh, feeling the weight of Massey's demise, Conrad Black uh, oversaw the country's, uh, the company's eventual downsizing. Uh, it was sold, sold again, and it eventually moved to the United States. Today, Massey exists only as a tractor brand, operated uh, and owned by an American firm called Eggco, uh, though it remains amongst the most popular tractor brands in the world. And anywhere you go, Massey Ferguson dealerships still exist. Okay, I, I'm going to pause here for a quick moment, and I want to have a teachable. I want to have a teachable moment about family firms, which is pretty topical, given what's going on right now with what's happening at Rogers, which is a family firm. And, and the lesson is this: uh, the end of family ownership can have bad consequences, like what happened in the Massey firm eventually. Though a lot of people made a lot of money off of Massey, uh, it can also have uh, bad consequences if a family sticks on and holds on to the family firm. Uh, Edward Rogers, who's in the middle of this maelstrom, is the third generation of Rogers to effectively run the company. And he's gotten himself in a little bit of trouble because uh, maybe as a third generation, he should leave it to the managers to run the firm. I don't know, it's not my company, uh, but it does provide some really interesting parallels between Rogers and Massey, uh, who do have a lot of uh, kind of uh, overlap. Okay. So what happened to all this money that the Massey company made over the course of its existence? Well, while Hart and the family did make an awful lot of money, uh, Hart and Vincent and the family spent a lot of it. And they spent a lot of it in a few ways. They spent the, the money that they made from the company through dividends, through profits when uh, Hart was alive and afterwards. Uh, they spent uh, the money from Hart's estate, which he left a lot of money in, uh, in uh, 1896 after he died. And uh, they spent a lot of uh, their money uh, on uh, after they got rid of some of their shares in the company. So every time they'd sh sell a bunch of shares, they'd get cash and they'd spend it. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not surprising being one of Canada's wealthiest families, uh, living in uh, the height of the Gilded Age between the 1890s and the 1920s, that even though they were, you know, stern Methodists by religion, they, they lived a Gilded Age life. They were, you know, the masses and then the masses. I, I thought I'd throw up some slides here that shows some of the houses that they bought, for instance, that they bought and they built. And there's three here. And uh, you're all probably pretty familiar with them. The one on the far left is 515 Jarvis Street. Uh, it was built in 1867, uh, originally for Arthur McMaster, who was the founder of McMaster College, which became McMaster University, which moved to Hamilton. And Hart Massey bought it in 1882. Today, it's known as the Keg Mansion. There's a restaurant there on Jarvis Street. And, and right next door is another mansion that was built uh, for Chester Massey, one of Hart's sons who ran the company. And it's right next door. And it's, it's still a pretty fantastic ma mansion. You can go online and look at pictures of the interior. Uh, one other a building that uh, home that the Masseys built was a Batterwood, which was built by Vincent and his wife, Alice, in the 1920s as an estate uh, not far from Coburg, where they'd, they'd entertain artists and they put their artwork up and they'd have all kinds of events. Uh, it's a pretty uh, a beautiful place, uh, and it, I think you can go and visit it. Now, they, they had other homes, too. There was one on Queen's Park Circle. Uh, and not only did they spend money on homes, but they 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 lived a, a pretty opulent lifestyle, which is not surprising given how wealthy they were. They traveled quite a bit, uh, and they were a, a little bit different than you and I. Now, they weren't ostentatious about it, but they were uh, the Masseys. Now, I'm sure people listening here probably uh, in the audience have a better sense of the Masseys and the family and how they live their lives do. I'm a business historian, so I focus more on the company than the family. Uh, so I'm sure we're going to get some great questions that will fill in the gaps of what we're talking about. But what I do want to talk about a little bit more is what they did with their money, the rest of their money, which is most of the money, and the philanthropy that the Masseys undertook as part of their um, uh, life. So if you want to switch to the next slide. Uh, Massey philanthropy was uh, one of the reasons that we're sitting here today uh, as part of this college. And the Masseys, uh, even though they spent uh, some of it on homes and travel and stuff like that, they gave most of it away. Uh, they gave a lot of away, probably, like I said, uh, most of it. Hart Massey gave quite a bit away during his lifetime. 
Uh, and after he passed away in 1896, one of the things that the family did was to create the Massey Family Foundation in 1918, which was left uh, uh, from, which was designed to disperse the funds left from Massey, uh, Hart Massey's estate. And in, in 1918, uh, there was about $3 million in the Massey Foundation Fund, which in today's dollars is about $70 million. So it was not a small amount of money. And don't forget, they'd already given away a lot of their money. Uh, they gave their money to arts, to music, to education. They gave their money to a whole host of groups and organizations, particularly in Toronto and especially to the University of Toronto. And this was a period in which there was a big upsurge in Canadian nationalism, especially after the 1920s. So there were lots of causes for the Masseys to give their money to. Uh, I want to just show three quick examples here. There's Massey Hall in 1884, uh, which Hart Massey built during his lifetime as a way to honor his son Charles, who had died. Sorry, 1890. Uh, Massey Hall is 1894. 1894. But Charles Massey died in 1894 of tuberculosis. Uh, that building cost about 150 grand to complete in 1894, which in today's money would probably be between five and eight million dollars. So this is a pretty significant outlay. And uh, they created one of the finest musical halls in North America of, of the, the period. And it's one of the reasons today that Toronto is still such a center for a live performance and entertainment because Massey Hall was one of the best places to go and perform and everybody and anybody who uh, was a performer was there. Uh, the middle one uh, we all know as well as Hart House, though a lot of students, like I say, uh, probably don't know that Hart House is named after Hart Massey. Uh, and Hart House emerged uh, as a consequence of Vincent's time as a student at U of T. It was started in about 1911, finished in 1919. I, I put up the link for uh, the 100th anniversary photo gallery for Hart House since it just celebrated its 100th anniversary. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it was one of the first general student buildings in North America. And uh, it's got, a, you know, a theater and a shooting range and a pool and all this stuff. It was a pretty lavish gift that the family gave to the university. Around the same time as Hart House was being built, on the far right is the Lillian Massey building, uh, which still exists at the corner of Avenue and Bloor. We walked by it. It used to be the headquarters for, uh, it used to have a uh, Club Monaco in it, uh, but uh, it was uh, the gift that Lillian Massey, one of Hart Massey's daughters, gave to the university to uh, house the Department of Household Science. And it was one of the first places where women on this campus uh, were taught by female faculty members and were able to get advanced degrees. So uh, it really reflected uh, the family's progressive approach towards education and, and teaching. But uh, it wasn't just these public and university buildings. The Massey Foundation, the family members over the last century have given away tens of millions of dollars to all kinds of causes. They refurbished Massey Hall. Uh, they created Massey College itself starting in 1958 as one of the last major gifts of the Massey Foundation. Uh, in 1958, the initial grant for Massey College was about $2 million dollars which today would be about $20 million, and they continue to support Massey initiatives at the college and elsewhere, including uh, the Massey Lectures. It's really an incredible legacy that this family has left, and it, uh, unfortunately, aside from a few names, it's somewhat unknown. So I'd like to quickly just finish up, and I know I've only got a minute or two left, uh, talking about some Massey legacies, which is the next slide, uh, and retreating and returning to one of the points, points that I started off with. Everyone here today, uh, especially this audience, probably knows about the Masseys and their monies and their influence. But I, I'd wager that most Canadians and an awful lot of U of T students don't. And, and that's a real shame because the legacy of the Masseys in Canada is profound and has shaped generations of Canadians. And, and moreover, the story of the Massey family itself is just as fascinating, just as compelling, just as dramatic as any of the much more famous, mostly American families that Canadians do know, uh, you know, wealthy industrialist families like the Rockefellers or the Fords or the Carnegies have lots of stuff written about them. And the Masseys do have lots of stuff written about them, but they don't have the same kind of public awareness, even in Canada, that the Masseys should. And, and, and this is a family that also had its share of pre uh, you know, dramatic stories, the Massey murder in 1915, uh, when a maid by the name of Carrie Davis shot Charles Burt Massey, one of Hart Massey's grandsons did. It was a trial of the century, but a lot of people don't know about this. 
Of course, a lot of people do know about Vincent Massey, who I've got an image of there as uh, the Governor General uh, in 1952. He was the first appointed Canadian-born Governor General. Uh, and the public uh, uh, service that Vincent Massey and his family uh, conducted uh, in the 40s and beyond, before and after, is really amazing. As a leading diplomat in the 1930s, as the Governor General, as a friend and a confidant to Canada's royal family, Vincent Massey was the closest thing to a royal family, Vincent and his family, that Canada's ever had. And just a couple of images there. There's the coronation ceremonies when Elizabeth descended to the throne in 1953, and as Governor General, Vincent Massey had to take a role in that. And then there's Vincent Massey meeting with his friends, Elizabeth Philip, in, in 1957. And, uh, you know, uh, Vincent was not just a family friend. Uh, they were quite close. Uh, the royals, uh, Elizabeth and the recently uh, deceased Philip would often visit them at uh, Batterwood uh, and uh, there's a room in Batterwood that's known as the Royal Suite because the Queen has stayed there so many times. But it's a shame that most people don't know about this fascinating story which despite all the public buildings struggles to be known by the general public. But then again when it comes to history and Canadian business history this is a typically Canadian problem that we're trying to alleviate. And I'll, I'll just switch to the last slide. Thank you. And I say thank you to um, uh, Principal DeRosiers for uh, inviting me to this admittedly brief overview. Uh, lots of stuff to talk about. Uh, there is a vast literature on Massey, uh, though it's a little bit older, some of it. Uh, talks about all kinds of aspects of their role in culture, the firm, uh, Vincent Massey's life, uh, great books, which I encourage people to get into. Uh, but I just want to say thank you to uh, Principal DeRosiers again and to Alyssa Ginsberg, Matt Glanfield, and of course uh, to Mark Bonham, uh, who's going to uh, take over now to uh, run the dialogue part in terms of asking some questions uh, and getting some questions for the audience. So I'm looking forward to hearing some thoughts and comments about uh, the Masseys and their monies. That's terrific. Uh, Dimitri, thank you very much. Fascinating. I'm, I, I'm a history buff myself. So when I hear these stories, I get very excited and very enthused and, and want to know more, want to, want to get, you know, go, go right to the library and start reading some of these books as well. Um, so thank you for giving us what is admittedly a brief overview because the history here is so rich. You mentioned how Canadians uh, um, really don't pay a lot of attention to the to business history. Why do you think that is? What is it something in our culture that we we just uh, don't uh, pay a lot of attention to people in the past who have been very successful in business or even people today who are very successful in business tend to be relatively low key compared to say the Americans and so on. What is it about Canadians that we are hesitant to celebrate our really successful Canadian business uh, histor uh, uh, success stories. Well, your your uh, your question includes part of the answer. I think there uh, part of it is really this kind of never ending comparison of Canadians being a small fish in small ponds and living right beside the biggest fish in the biggest ponds of all. So you know a lot of Canadian business leaders and firms. Uh, aren't seen as being uh, world class and really interesting and all that dynamic unless they make it really big in the United States or elsewhere. And, and you know, the funny thing is Massey did. Massey was a huge multinational corporation, but you know, it, it, it's time really passed by the 1980s. So Canadians often will forget about this stuff or they don't have the same kind of public awareness because there isn't this huge machine of, of publicity and movies. And, you know, uh, we're so inundated with American stories and American uh, uh, information about stuff that we often lose sight of our own stories, mm -hmm. even when it's all around us. Massey, ha Massey Hall, Massey College, Hart House, uh, we often kind of miss that, which is silly. And, and you know, it's, it's something else that's kind of silly. You know, the Massey family is perfect as an example of that, you know, Raymond Massey was famous, uh, Vincent's brother, as an actor who went down to the United States and became famous playing Abraham Lincoln and it was a whole bunch of movies. Uh, but there's never been a feature film on the Massey family uh, because Canada doesn't really have a, a significant film industry that could really popularize this. Uh, you know, on the question of Canadian business history, I always say to my students, you know, sometimes my job title is, you know, chair in Canadian business history 
is, you know, two or three of the world's most boring words in Indian <laughs> business and history. As soon as you put them all together and you say, come students, learn about this stuff. They're like, what are you talking about? Why don't you give me something better? So, you know, part of it is a, a kind of uh, a, 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 a crisis of identity in the words that we use to describe things. But, you know, I can see from a, 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 you know, a 19 year old student's perspective that sometimes that's not the most interesting thing to start off with, even though once you get by those words, the stories are so oh, fascinating. Yeah. yeah, there are. There are just so many fascinating stories there that just aren't known by Canadians in, in business history. And it's a shame um, But hopefully you will change that uh, as well a few others who, who really love the topic such as myself as well you mentioned um as well that the uh it was they were very much a methodist family uh very religious and thinking of some of the other very successful business um families of that generation such as the gooderums or the george cox and his family also methodists very strict methodists mm -hmm. Is there some link between being a successful uh, in business and being a Methodist? <laughs> Is there something about uh, that religion or that sort of uh, culture that uh, aids someone in, in building a business empire? Oh, for sure. And, and Flavel is another one, you know, Flavel Joseph House, Flavel, where, exactly. where, uh, right across on Queens Park. Yes. I mean, those were Methodist heavyweights and Hart Massey himself was, uh, he, he converted to Methodism uh, you know, he was in upstate in New York in the 1850s during the, the, the burned over district era. And, and, you know, I like to think of it this way, and I know this is probably going to come across as pithy, but the Methodists are an early version of the, the prosperity gospel, i.e., you know, you do good works here on earth uh, and, you know, you're rewarded by your hard work, by uh, good fortune and success. And then you give it all away. You, you do give it all away. Uh, you know, now in the 21st century, uh, most of these, many of these billionaires don't give it away. They don't feel a religious obligation to give it away. But I really do think that there was a kind of uh, shrewdness and a hard headedness to Methodism. Uh, that allowed businesses and business leaders to prosper because they did care about the bottom line and they were so economic about stuff. I mean, uh, if you read if you read into Hart Massey, he was pretty tight fisted. Uh, he was old school, like he would have arguments with people, even when he was a millionaire about uh, your fence is on the edge of my property that I own in Coburg and I'm going to take you to court for a dollar twenty four. Uh, stuff like that. Uh, you know, he had a lot of uh, battles over his workers, though he was a very generous employer at times. And he, he built all kinds of uh, paternalistic uh, welfare aspects to his company. There were magazines and working members bureaus and stuff like that. But that kind of idea of working very hard in God's, uh, for God's mission and getting the rewards of life and then spreading that wealth to other people was very much part of that Methodist philosophy, I yeah. think. And in, in spreading that wealth, you noted that um, they really were focused on arts and culture um, and education. Why was it those particular areas that were important to them? For example, you would think that um, a firm that relied so much on manufacturing would take an interest in engineering, for example. Why, yeah. why wouldn't he have donated his money or, or to engineering scholarships and, and, and or, uh, ventures and so on? Well, you know, uh, Karen Finley has a, a, a great book that tackles this question specifically. It's called uh, "A Force of the Force of Culture," and it really addresses Vincent in particular and yeah. why he seemed to fall so far from the family tree, mm -hmm. embracing uh, arts and culture and education. Mm -hmm. And uh, she she makes the case that partly it was a Methodist response. It was like mm -hmm. uh, to make better works in the world. But mm -hmm. I also think it was a reaction to the sternness of his grandfather, the kind of <laughs> economy of how he ran things uh you know um vincent bought a ton of art like so much of the artwork in the national yeah. gallery uh so mm -hmm. much of the artwork at the ago places like that are, are coming from the massey family and the massey wealth and he he supported uh, so many artists and as we know is i suppose it's his cousin lauren harris who was part of the uh, massey harris was, was the leader of the group of seven so I think also it's not just uh, reacting to his family's uh, upbringing, his Stern family's upbringing. It's also a consequence of the fact that in the 1920s, there is this huge upsurge of Canadian nationalism and Canadian national feeling around arts yeah. and literature and education, where you start to see, you know, the group of seven founded in 1920, mm -hmm. uh, the Canadian Historical Association founded in 1920, 
uh, magazines like the um, uh, Canadian Dimension, yeah. founded in 19... So there's this kind of moment, which is perfect for Methodism, mm -hmm. Massey falling far <laughs> from the family uh, tree, and an upsurge in arts that, uh, you know, opens the door for him. And, and don't forget, too, he went to U of T. Yes. Uh, and That's he followed awesome. in, uh, you know, he took a lot of courses that were in the humanities, and he was deeply affected by his time at U of T. He was, he was uh, uh, friends with Mackenzie King, and a lot of that generation of nationalists who were very much uh, in favor of Canadian culture and Canadian mm -hmm. identity. So that's where a lot of that money ended up going to. Yeah, well, without a doubt, Vincent Massey was a, was a tremendous nationalist. In fact, it's said that when he produced his Massey report, commission report, which was on arts, education, and culture in the country, he specifically, he was very, very focused on publishing yeah. that as a document that would 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 really promote Canadian nationalism. He designed the cover, he chose the fonts, he chose the pictures that went in it. He was very, to him it was like he was publishing his, his uh, manifest. It, it was uh, a manifesto. On Canadian culture. Yeah, it, it very yeah. much was a manifesto and the legacy aspect of it is still with us today. I mean, mm -hmm. the Massey Commission recommendations include yeah, no. a national art gallery, a national library, the National Archives, the Canada Council, support for the arts, support for institutions like the Stratford Festival and other arts organizations, uh, direct funding for writers and artists. I mean, uh, these are things that in the 21st century, Canadians kind of take for granted, but he really envisioned this, pushed it forward and be through fear, sheer force of will and, and wealth and money and, and prominence uh, made these a reality that are lasting. I mean, I, I would say, you know, as a historian, uh, along with a couple of other Royal Commissions, the RCAP, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, the Royal Commission on uh, um, the 1984 Commission, the Massey Commission is one of the most yeah. important commissions that Canadians ever uh, had the benefit of gaining uh, the recommendations of its commissioners. Uh, it, it's such a profound moment, and it comes at a moment when Canadians are really reimagining themselves in a 20th century world that doesn't want to be necessarily American, doesn't want to necessarily be British, but really does want to be identifiably Canadian. And this is where Vincent comes in. He's like, I'm identifiably Canadian. I'm, I'm the real deal. I'm born here. I'm going to be the first Canadian governor general. And I'm going to say, this is how we can make ourselves a distinct, have a distinctive voice in the world. And he does a pretty good job about it. I was going to ask you a little bit about this, the, the idea of leaving the firm and, and, you know, essentially leaving being a, a businessman to become what he became, you know, a policymaker, the governor general and so on. From a business perspective, that would have been very controversial, no? To just uh, decide that you, you're going to let other people run the family business. Well, it's a really transitional moment in the broader life of Canadian business because there hadn't been a lot of uh, family firms that had been so successful and there hadn't been any Canadian family firms where the family had relinquished its control over the firm. So it was controversial in some ways, uh, but at the same time, it made a lot of sense. Right. Uh, you know, he was the fourth generation. He didn't have an expertise. You know, his interests clearly were elsewhere. And it was coming at a time in the 1920s and 1930s where a whole new class of managers who are professionals, yeah. who know how to run these large firms are starting to appear on the scene. I mean, this is the period in which, uh, you know, General Motors gets uh, figured out as a multi-divisional firm where uh, the DuPont Corporation is a big multinational mm -hmm. firm with different branches. And what these companies are doing is they're bringing in professional managers because the family founders can't do it anymore. They yeah, don't yeah. have the capacity. They don't have the mm -hmm. ability. They don't have the education. They don't have the wherewithal to do it. So uh, in one way, you know, for the family, it was probably like, well, this is a shock. We're going to let go of, uh, you know, a company that started in 1847 mm -hmm. and really has its roots even more deeply. And, but at the same time, it's from a business right perspective, thing. it made complete sense because they handed it over to people who could do a much better job. And, you know, the proof was in the pudding by the 50s and 60s. When E.P. Taylor reorganizes the company completely, it becomes a world beater. And that wouldn't have happened if Vincent had still been there. Mm -hmm. So and that's I was interesting also uh, saying what has become, you know, the when I was a kid, Massey Ferguson, uh, we knew about it just because we saw the logo pretty much uh, 
everywhere. If you, if, if you drove r around the country and drove in rural areas. So uh, what happened to become now the replaced by John Deere and, and so on? It's just uh, things up and go and there's cycles uh, of, of businesses and so on? Well, well, part of it, yeah, it was a cycle of business. It was a transformation. So by the, by the 1980s, you know, Massey had really focused in on small tractors. I mean, you saw them everywhere because they were little one person tractors uh, and they, they hadn't really gotten into the large combines, which John Deere and International Harvester were doing. And the thing is, by the 70s and 80s, agribusiness is moving away from small family farms towards mm -hmm. factory farming and giant farms. So Massey's kind of pushed out of that market, especially in North America, uh, mm -hmm. less so in places like, um, you know, uh, South America or India, where there's still a lot of small family farms. And, you know, uh, when I... When I talk to my students in the MBA class, many of whom are from India and around mm -hmm. the world, they're all, oh, Massey Ferguson. Of course, I know Massey Ferguson. They also know uh, Bata, because Bata Shoes, which is the other <laughs> one that I could talk about as a, as a global Canadian brand. Uh, and uh, so they really got caught in this transition in the 1980s. They got, uh, you know, a cash crunch. Um, but the, the market had kind of moved away from where they were. Uh, mm -hmm. to a large degree. So that helps to explain. Uh, eventually, Conrad Black uh, tries to get the government to bail Massey out, uh, both mm -hmm. the Ontario government and the federal mm -hmm. government. Uh, that doesn't happen. Uh, and eventually it's kind of, uh, well, there, there's a part bailout and then eventually it's sold. It moves to Buffalo. It becomes mm -hmm. the Verity Corporation in 1987 and then eventually it gets bought by this big American conglomerate. So mm -hmm. the brand still exists all over the place. They still make Massey tractors, but Massey okay. doesn't make them. Uh, yeah. And the brand was so powerful that it continued mm -hmm. on decades after uh, the Massey, Massey Ferguson no longer existed as a company. Uh, first, uh, you know, it takes advantage of uh, the British preferential tariff system starting in the 1890s to ship its products to British dominions, uh, you know, settler colonialism, places where there's farming happening in New Zealand, Australia, uh, India, South, Af South Africa. These are markets where Massey can, uh, you know, sell its products a little bit more cheaply than the competition. So it does so, but it also goes into this expansionary phase where it buys companies in uh, those places. So, uh, you know, in the in the 50s and the 60s, Massey's swallowing up the smaller uh, 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 Australian uh, tractor makers because it's become so big. They've been doing this since the 1880s and 1890s. That, that was the, one of the keys to their success. Massey wasn't a very good innovative company in terms of they didn't build better tractors, but they often bought companies that build better tractors and made them Massey tractors. So they do this in uh, the British Empire an awful lot. Uh, Ferguson is a great example. Uh, so uh, it becomes Massey Ferguson because Ferguson is uh, one of the leading British tractor manufacturers that Massey takes over in 53. And they sell their goods in uh, Australia and New Zealand and South Africa and India and all over the place. So so they're pretty good at expanding into these places. And then, uh, you know, in the post-war period, they also expand into non, you know, British uh, marketplaces. So they go to Brazil, they go to Argentina, they go all over the place and they go to the States too. I mean, they were in the States pretty early on. Massey is one of the first Canadian companies that takes over a, a competitor uh, in the United States uh, as early as like the 1880s. They're already down there doing acquisitions, which a lot of Canadian companies weren't really doing in the States because the competition was so hard. But because they become so big in Canada, they've got the size to do this. You talked about their marketing as well. Certainly, um, they were quite innovative at the time in terms of their marketing, uh, in terms of the the uh, enthusiasm of their marketing. You talked about, I mean, I, I've heard that when, when the first tractor was shipped to a small town, they would organize a gala dinner that night <laughs> in a local town of 100 people uh, and sponsor a, a big dinner for the whole town because one tractor had been ordered and was being delivered that day. It just, it's really savvy marketing, right? I mean, you've really made an event out of this. This guy was doing destination event marketing uh, long before anybody in the 20th century, 21st century thought about it. And he created effectively the first generation of tractor gearheads. 
uh, because you know there's a lot of people nowadays who love cars and they're like, oh, I've got a '57 Chevy that I'm rebuilding and I found the part for it and I love it. Well, he's doing this, uh, you know, in in even before 19, 1900, right? Where he's sending out catalogs and he's trying to make a connection mm-hmm. between the owners of the tractor or the owners of the mm-hmm. device and the device itself. That it becomes, you know, it's it's more than just a product, more than just a tool that you use. It's part of your identity. I'm a Massey Ferguson man. Uh, I don't, I don't go in for hair, you know, I don't go in for these other, uh, uh, John Deere. No, 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 no. I'm very loyal. So brand loyalty is something that he really Mm -hmm. works to establish. And you see it generationally where farmers often pass their farms down from generation Mm -hmm. to generation. And they're like, well, of course we're going to have a Massey tractor as the new tractor. That's all we've ever had. Uh, Mm -hmm. We're a Massey family. So he's really good at at really instilling that brand loyalty. And the company is very good at doing that, too. Uh, You know, one of the things we always talk about, uh, the Eaton's catalog, that Timothy Eaton's was really good at creating a catalog system, you know, Amazon before Amazon. Uh, Well, uh, Hart Massey is pretty good at doing the same thing with his catalogs for um, tractors. And he makes them very colorful. Uh, He makes them very appealing. So they're not just schematics and text tech stuff it's really kind of like you're buying a new car it's a new tractor mm-hmm. before cars and he's, mm-hmm. he's really effective in doing that and in the, in the 20th century uh you know they encourage this kind of uh gearhead obsessiveness where there are massy clubs or you know people go to uh, they re they re um refurbish their massy tractor from 1942 and they put it on display or they put it in a competition for this is the this is my refurbished uh, Massey 360 tractor. Look at it. Look how beautiful it is. And they, they're able to really develop that brand loyalty and connection in a way that most people are not through all these different uh, um, uh, tools. You, you know, I, 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 I used to teach in Peterborough and I drive by uh, a Massey Ferguson dealership that was on the 115 every time I went to Peterborough and it would remind me of the power and influence of Massey Ferguson. The company had been gone for 30 years. Yes, the dealership was still there and the brand stuck out from a a mile away. Well, you mentioned um, how they had this big plant in Toronto. Um, But how much how much was there was there pushback by uh, prairie farmers that again on pricing and so on that, oh, you know, the power of the East was really controlling even how they could farm and, uh, you know, cause they had to buy those tractors from an Eastern uh, manufacturer there was, 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 did they have to deal with a lot of that? And if they did, how did they deal with that? Yes. I mean, if you want to talk about regional uh, grievances, uh, you know, along with banks, uh, yeah, farm banks, implement yeah. machinery was one of the, the things that really uh, upset a lot of Western farmers, which is why you get these protest movements that exist from, back then right up until today. Uh, now, Hart Massey uh, was pretty shrewd in supporting the tariff. Uh, and at times, though, when liberals were in office, for instance, and, and Vincent becomes a pretty stalwart liberal, the family and the company, before it gets taken over by professional managers, is willing to lower the tariff. They're, they, they become, to a certain point, by the 1910s and the 1920s, they're so big and they're so able to kind of stand on their own two feet without tariff protection that they say, it's fine, lower the tariff. It goes from 35% down to 17.5% or 20%, and then it goes even lower by the 1920s for farm machinery. And in the 1940s, there's actually a, a, a one, a lot of people don't know about this, but there is actually a special agreement between Canada and the United States for free trade in farm implements. Oh. It's the very first free trade agreement between Canada and the United States and it happens okay. in the 1940s and it allows uh, farm tools to go back and forth and that's partly a consequence of Massey being so um, well developed that they don't need tariff protection and since they have by that point you know 70 percent of the Canadian market they, they they don't they're not an infant industry anymore they're a fully grown industry so they don't need it so uh, that is a great question because there's a whole history within that Mm-hmm. And you talk about financing. How did the farmers finance purchase of tractors? Were, were the, was the Massey involved in the business itself involved in financing? Yeah, and one of the things, and I should have mentioned this, uh, they're one of the first ones to do installment plans for their tractors yeah. and, and for their farm implements. So uh, it wasn't financing in a traditional sense. The car companies really do that. Uh, starting in the 1910s mm-hmm. uh, and the 1920s with GMAC and stuff like that. But Massey is one of the first to say, oh, you don't have to pay for it all up front. You're going to be able to pay for it in installments over time, which mm-hmm. gives farmers a break. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it makes it very, uh, it makes the terms pretty uh, much more um, beneficial for them, but it also banks stuff for Massey, right? And they, they can bank yeah. the sale and get the money later on, which is great mm -hmm. for their inventories, is great for their accounting. Uh, and it's a real great innovation that uh, the Massey Corporation uses to expand their reach, expand their market. Uh, installment purchasing of tractors because it's a big ticket item for a farmer whether it's a thresher or a brine grinder or a combine or whatever uh it's going to be a pretty big ticket item so you want to be able to make sure that you're not bankrupting the guy right off the bat when they purchase the item you're giving them a chance to spread out the cost over time so i think they put in installment uh, fi uh financing probably by the 1870s or 1880s it's that early it's that early on wow yeah yeah, it must have scared the banks to death as well if they were doing it themselves as opposed to doing it through the local bank. Yeah, uh, you <laughs> banks know, uh, were, you were really not in the business of, uh, uh, of providing installment mm -hmm. financing at all until the nineteen sixties, seventies. Yeah, I mean, uh, banks are not allowed uh, to do mortgages until the nineteen fifties. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of Canadians don't realize this. A lot of Canadians don't realize that their first credit card is. Uh, yes, Diners Club, which shows up in nineteen fifty-two, yeah. I think. Visa doesn't yeah. appear until the sixties. Chargex, yes. Chargex, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, credit uh, and uh, buying uh, in advance and paying interest is something that really is a very recent phenomenon. It's yeah. Point. Now, you did mention, uh, there's a question here from Michael Barclay about um, further reading in books. Uh, he's, he's noting that there's actually a book. Uh, reading you can recommend or any anywhere people can go to get more uh, about this oh, fast reading fantastic. history uh, so uh, I didn't know that that book was coming out and thank you Michael for pointing it out because I'm going to get my hands on it because it'll probably have a really good interesting history of you know Mass Massey Hall is such an amazing facility uh, I think anybody who's grown up in Toronto has probably gone to a concert there at some point I know I've gone to at least 10 uh, and the first time you walk in you're kind of awed by the joint mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And it is a great legacy of that place. So I will get my hands on that book. Uh, you know, some of the books that are out there about uh, uh, a new fellow had a book that was written in 1969 about the Massey Corporation. Uh, Michael Bliss's work on Canadian business talks about the Massey Corporation a lot. But on the cultural side, Paul Litt's book on uh, yeah. the Masseys mm -hmm. is pretty important. Karen mm -hmm. Finlay's book on the Masseys. And of course, uh, Claude Bissell, who was a very famous U of T faculty member and administrator, uh, wrote the biography of Vincent Massey. Uh, there, uh, there was a book that came out um, just a couple years yeah. ago about the Massey murders uh, in 1915, uh, which uh, uh, Charles Charles Massey is murdered by a, a maid uh, in the annex. Um, so uh, there's a great literature out there, and I'm going to get my hands on that Massey uh, Hall book uh, from Michael. And Principal DeRosi, I think you had a question too. Well, I just wanted to say that uh, Claude Bissell is, was one of the the founders, in a way, of, of Massey College. So it's uh, it's really uh, Vincent Massey's uh, brainchild with his friend Claude Bissell and then Robertson Davies uh, putting it together. So it's a very uh, fascinating history. I it, it's it's astonishing to me the idea of uh, paving it forward. You know, like giving your money away. In, in so many uh, uh, different different venues, and certainly, I think uh, as I look around, I uh, I benefit a lot <laughs> from yes. from that, that that idea of giving your money to educational institutions, to art, and so on. So I'm sure we're going to have to continue to think about the, the different ways of Massey College. So I just I just wanted to thank you for uh, for being here and enlightening us about where does the money come from, which is something that uh, all the, well, everyone that benefits wants to know uh, what's the, the, the legacy of it. And we want to continue to investigate. There's so many aspects of, uh, of uh, the life of Vincent Massey, of his importance for our cultural, Canadian culture. We've had an event about the future of the Massey Commission's recommendations. Where are we now, vis-à-vis uh, -vis them? Uh, so, I I don't know whether there's. A, I was always fascinating also with the CCM. My first bicycle was a CCM, so I'm glad that uh, I had a connection to Massey even as a as a young woman. So, did they stay? They did not stay in the bicycle business, did they? I know they sold that part to uh, what became the the CCM a monopoly on bicycles, uh, and then eventually that kind of <laughs> 
at Peter to weigh because the bicycle which was a bit of a that, the story behind that parts. is a bit of a scandal too if you yeah, ever yeah, read up oh. on that one is a fascinating business history story there <laughs> absolute uh you know uh the Methodist Bicycle Company um there are some really good stories about that you know there was one thing I was just going to say Principal DeRosier because yeah. you mentioned yeah. your office there and uh, the legacy of Massey uh, just spreads itself further and further because uh, Tom Simons who was the, the president of Trent University had yeah. been uh at uh, Devonshire House, which is now Monk, across the street, mm -hmm. when Massey was being built. And he met Ron Tom. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on, when uh, he was appointed to become president of Trent and they, they needed an architect, he said, oh, I, I've got the person in mind for Trent University because he'd built this amazing building, Massey College, and that's who we're going to get. So in, a, in an indirect way, uh, really in a yeah. direct way, you know, Trent University and Ron mm -hmm. Tom are such an important part of the Canadian educational and architectural landscape because of, of the Massey legacy. It's just amazing all these connections and how they continue to influence and shape our, our world. Well, I, I just want to thank you both for uh, for leading this discussion. It's fascinating. And I think we'll need to, to uh, get a second installment for sure. So thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you around at Massey College to come and see what it looks like, but also uh, to come to all of our events. Merci. Great. Thank you.